Welcome everyone again to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm Anthony Perillo, the Forensic Psychology Training Director in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at the University of New Mexico. For our talk today, if you have any questions for our presenters, make sure you ask them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box down below anytime you feel comfortable. Uh, just know that we hold those until the end. We try to get to as many questions as possible, but just forgive us if we can't get to yours. If you are pursuing continuing medical education credits, there will be a sign in in the chat shortly, and you can open that link to get your credits. For those pursuing APA continuing education credits, the link to that will be again in the chat box, but about 55 minutes on the hour um, near the end of the talk. You'll have to open that link before you close the webinar and make sure you save your certificate after you complete the survey because we don't have access to those after the fact. There will be a recording uh, link and slides available for this talk sometime later in the week. And as a heads up for next week's talk, we have Drs. Danielle Slakoff and Dr. Stacy Merkin, who will be discussing service providers' experiences with trans and immigrant women clients of intimate partner violence. Okay, but now is what we've been waiting for for this week. I'm thrilled to introduce you to today's speaker who'll be discussing adolescents who engage in harmful sexual behavior. This is Dr. Nikki Colombino. Dr. Colombino is a licensed psychologist in New Jersey, New York, Michigan, and through SIPAC, who specializes in forensic psychology. She received her PhD in clinical forensic psychology from the Graduate Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and she is the currently the lead psychologist at the Center for Forensic and Clinical Psychology of New Jersey, conducting a range of forensic assessments for criminal, civil, and immigration matters. She also supervises the forensic unit at a local county agency, providing court-ordered psychological and psychosexual evaluations for juveniles in the criminal legal system. And she supervises a team of psychologists, clinical social workers, and externs in an outpatient treatment program for youth adjudicated for engaging in illegal sexual behavior. Since 2008, Dr. Colombina has been engaged in research that examines perpetration patterns of those who commit sexual harm and evidence-based sexual violence prevention strategies. She has numerous peer-reviewed publications and has presented her research at national conferences. And in addition, Dr. Colombino has held adjunct faculty positions and is regularly invited to guest lecture at universities on forensic evaluation and juvenile justice issues. Um, Nikki, Dr. Colombino, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, um, we're just honored to have you join our series and thankful that you're um, willing to share your expertise with our audience. Uh, I'm looking forward to this and I will uh, now throw it over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Dr. Perillo. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here today and to talk to you all about adolescents who engage in harmful sexual behavior. So let's jump right in. Okay, so we went, we went over my bio. Um, all right, so what I wanted to start, before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about what led me to this work. So most of my training, as, as you heard, I uh, was working with uh, adults, uh, providing treatment and assessment services, mostly in psychiatric or forensic settings. And my research was focused on sexual violence prevention patterns and how to understand the circumstances in these perpetration patterns surrounding offenses so that it could better inform prevention policies. When I graduated, I was job searching and I interviewed at a local county agency where I'd be responsible for conducting psychosexual and psychological evaluations for youth who were involved in the court system. And I was really intrigued by this new area, working with court-involved youth. So I went for it. I threw myself into the trainings and research and what it would be like to work with justice-involved youth, especially those who perpetrated sexual harm. And eventually I became the supervisor of the forensic unit, as well as supervisor of our outpatient program for youth who've engaged in illegal sexual behavior. They're all court ordered into our treatment program. And I've been there for about six years now. And I'm also working in private practice at the Center for Forensic and Clinical Psychology of New Jersey, where we conduct a variety of forensic evaluations. But I also get to continue to provide our empirically informed assessment of youth. So I wanted to take a minute just to talk a little bit about why I love working with youth. And there's a few things to this. And I'm sure anyone on, on here today who work with youth um, likely share, share the same uh, feeling and that 
The system for youth is much more rehabilitation focused. Um, the court and the system are not just focused on how are we going to punish this person for their harmful sexual behavior or their, their general harmful behavior, but what is what is it that we can do to help this youth get on a pro-social path to lead their healthy life, their best life, to help them move forward? And so that's that's really one thing that's really drawn me to this. And one of my goals today was to be able to really integrate that into everything that I, I, I talked to you about today. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna, our learning objectives are to one, we're gonna analyze the differences between adolescents and adults who engage in harmful sexual behavior. We're going to identify risk and protective factors for adolescents who engage in harmful sexual behavior. And we're gonna describe challenges conducting risk assessment of the adolescents who engage in harmful sexual behavior. Uh, just a few notes for today's talk. So we're gonna be talking generally about youth. When I say youth, I mean 12 through, through 18 generally. Um, so, in New Jersey, 12 is the age of prosecution. So those who are under 12 typically are not seen in coming through our court system. Um, they're often not being referred for psychosexual evaluations through the court. And we often don't see them in our treatment program. Uh, and I know that that really could vary state by state and also um, country to country. And I say up to 18, Sometimes we do get youth who are slightly older than that uh, if their offense was committed as a juvenile. Uh, but I think given the type of talk we're doing today, which really is more of this broad overview, I think it's best if we keep it youth being defined as ages 12 through 18, uh, that, that stage of adolescence. And really importantly, language. Um, so as you, it's probably a, it probably sounds like a, a mouthful for me to say, adolescents who engage in harmful sexual behavior, but why does that matter, right? Wait, why not just use juvenile sex offender or JSOs as very uh, traditionally it used to be referred to as, and to be honest, sometimes still referred to as, um, especially depending on the residential treatment program, et cetera, that I've had interactions with. So why does it matter? Um, so the first thing that pops into most people's minds when they think of a sex offender are things like predator, pedophile, offender, perpetrator, and it evokes this visual reaction and opinions. It, this individual is dangerous. They're going to reoffend. Treatment's not going to work. Um, they're damaged in some way. And so labels are harmful. And we want people who've committed sexual offenses to be more than just their offense. So we use first person language. We label the behavior, not the person. Um, and this is especially true for youth. This is especially important for them. Okay, so um, I've decided on using the term adolescents who engage in harmful sexual behavior for our talk today. Uh, and in uh, at the county program I work at, we do use the term illegal sexual behavior typically or adjudicated delinquent for an illegal sexual behavior because that really does capture, we have all court ordered youth. So they engage in a legal sex, in illegal sexual behavior and they were adjudicated delinquent for that. Um, but I decided to stay with the term harmful for today because what is legal in one state uh, can differ in a different state. So state to state legal definitions can vary in, in different countries it can vary. So I thought it best to stay with uh, harmful as our common language to describe this behavior today. All right, so jumping in, before we can start talking about what's harmful or problematic, uh, we need to think about what's normative. So what is normative sexual behavior in youth? And there are empirical resources that really discuss what's normative or concerning at each stage. So whether it's the preschool stage, uh, elementary school, middle school, um, high school aged, uh, you know, all the way up through adulthood, of course, um, and, and further in life. Um, and, and what is really normative? But for the purpose of today's talk, since we're focusing on that 12 through 18, I'm going to focus on adolescence. Um, and so it, what's normative can really vary by age. We'll focus on that one subset, but do know that that information is out there. Um, and I'd be happy to point you in that direction. If you were, if you were interested in that, you could always email me afterwards. Um, but there's still much to be learned about what's normative. And so it can be difficult sometimes to determine what behaviors are of concern. 
So I know a few weeks back, Dr. Drew Kingston had presented us um, in the adult world on statistics about what would be considered disordered sexual behavior, for example. And the message or part of the message that was coming out of that was also that we need more information about what is normative. And so I would argue that in adolescence, it's even more difficult to get at this, this data because um, they're adolescents and studying adolescents and children can, can be more challenging. So um, we're gonna talk about what we do now. Uh, and so ages um, nine through 12 is typically when there's those first feelings of sexual attraction. Uh, usually it's ages around age 12 when it can be more of the onset of sexual fantasies and this increased interest to act on those fantasies. And what kinds of behaviors are normal in adolescence it can really vary, right? So hugging, kissing, holding hands, um, being interested in uh, sexually explicit images or erotic imagery, having sexually explicit conversations with peers, sexting behaviors, we'll talk about that more in a few moments, uh, masturbation, and having consensual sexual interactions with their peers. But um, again, as I mentioned, these are just some sort of general things that we know to be normative, but uh, it would be nice if we could have even um, further data to really be able to understand uh, how this be, how this is normal versus when becomes concerning. We'll talk a little bit about what we do know as to when a professional or a parent might say, you know what, this, this does need intervention. Um, aside, of course, it becoming illegal needs intervention, but there's other things also to look out for as well. So some things that might be considered to be a concern would be when the sexual issues or behaviors become uncomfortable for the adolescent themselves or um, if the issues or the behaviors start to create conflict between the adolescent and their environment or some way, um, or if there's some conflict with the um, school or family and peer relationships, like for example, if we have a youth who is masturbating at school and they've been redirected not to do so, but they continue to do so, um, or behaviors that can cause damage to one body. So uh, masturbating to the point of hurting oneself and continuing to do so, that would be cause of concern. All right, so some more normal adolescent sexual behaviors, uh, pornography use. So we know our youth are using pornography. And these statistics that I was able to find are a little, I mean, 2020, so it's a little old, right? Uh, and I would, I would argue that these might've even gone up since then, um, just because in, our, in, our, in my world, uh, almost, I, it, I've yet to find an adolescent who has not watched pornography in the youth that I have seen. Um, but these are the statistics we have. So 68.4% of adolescents report exposure to online pornography with a mean onset uh, for males from 13 to 14 years old. And what I think is really interesting um, is that 35 to 66% had unintentionally uh, first accessed uh, pornography. So they, they landed upon it or they came upon it um, unintentionally. And I think that this is pretty notable. And I know it's a concern that all parents have that, that youth are gonna um, be on the internet and they're gonna happen upon something that, uh, that, they, that they don't want their kids to see. But I don't think that people realize how easy it is. So I'm going to give an example. Um, we had a youth um, who had told us that the only way that they found pornography was they were on um, YouTube Kids, actually, um, and they were they so they were on there, and there was an ad. They clicked the ad. It led them to a different part of YouTube, and then they clicked another ad that they saw, and it brought up a sexually explicit image. It was the first time he had ever seen it. And then the way he used to find pornography was he would use YouTube um, ads to, to find pornography. Um, so it's not always accessing pornography websites or typing in the Google um, search box, what is sex or something like that. Um, so what are some of the motivations for pornography use? So besides the obvious curiosity or masturbation, um, the important to know is, you know, so there could be the, you know, the, or boredom or lack of engagement with peers or activities, but youth are also seeking out pornography for sexual education. Uh, I think that links back to our curiosity I was talking about, but we always ask our kids in the assessments, have, have your parents talked to you about this? Or what does your sexual education in schools look like? 
And often they either didn't have it in school or it was just a one-time thing according to them and it left more questions than answers. And um, there's this whole other issue about um, you know, presenting presenting some information, but not all of the information. And so the youth are then seeking it out on their own and it lands them to pornography and they're using pornography for sex education. And we can have a whole other continuing education talk on how problematic it is that youth are using pornography for sex education. Um, and as I mentioned, so some other motivations are certainly boredom or lack of engagement with peers or activity. And I think we definitely, I think one of the stats that I think definitely supports this is um, the pornography increase that we saw during the pandemic. So Pornhub um, had put out the statistic that from February to March 2020, so just right at the start of the pandemic, in that those those few weeks, there was an 11 percent increase in viewership alone. So just having this unstructured time that that they had um, not had previously before, and I know that we've certainly anecdotally seen um, very similar types of increases. Okay, uh, moving on to more some normal other normal adolescent sexual behavior. So what's interesting is the research has shown this long term decline in adolescent sexual activity. So there's decreases in partner sexual interactions and solo masturbation frequency over the decade. If we look at research that was um, data collected from 2009 to 2018. And um, Lindbergh et al. had analyzed data from 2006 to 2010 and found about half of the adolescents had engaged in at least one sexual behavior by age 19. And, and this study was done to look at contraceptive use uh, over time. And what was interesting was that there was a decrease in condom use from 2006 to 2019. So I add that. So we know that there is this decrease in sexual activity, but there's also this decrease in condom use. So um, it's, it's not necessarily less risky for our kids. Um, and then CDC released the Youth Risk Behavior Survey at the end of January, I believe it was, it might've been early February, um, again, showing this decline in partnered sexual activity. And that data was um, from 2011 to 2021. Uh, and between, so from that survey, uh, from that research, um, we know that between years 2019 to 2020, 30% of high school students had reported ever having sex, which was an 8% decline from um, the year prior. Okay, another big topic, normal adolescent sexual behavior is sexting. Uh, again, this is, I'm, I can never do this justice in, in this amount of time with all talking about other, uh, other material that I'm covering. It's again, a talk in itself. Um, but sexting is a very common behavior among, among adolescents. So in our study that we have up here, the our first statistic that we have from 2018, it was a meta-analysis done, um, youth under 18, uh, data collected between 1990 and June 2016, and they found that 14.8% were sending and receiving sex. Um, and then our second study that we have here, which is a little more current, uh, was 39 studies um, from between the years of 2009 and 2015. Uh, and we see that there is this overall increase in sexting over time. So you'll see here from this published study in uh, 2022, 19.3% of youth had sent a text, 34.8% received a sext, and 14.5% had forwarded a sext without consent. And again, the data was from 2015 was the most recent year included in that. And I would strongly argue that we probably would see um, more, uh, more sexting behaviors than this currently. Um, so again, it's important to, to talk about this issue because despite the commonality, sexting by minors is creating and disseminating, disseminating child sexual exploitive or explicit material or CSUN material. And um, this is handled differently depending on the state, the county, the country, uh, and whether it's prosecuted or not. Um, I can speak at my local county agency. We do have diversion programming. So these offenses are often um, diverted away from the court system. But I know that is certainly not the case in, in all jurisdictions. Okay, so we've talked about what's normal. So what's concerning? How do we know if something is concerning? 
Um, so just very generally, uh, we consider something to be concerning because it's harmful to themselves or to others. And they continue the behavior even after they've been redirected. So some behaviors that warrant concern um, are problematic self-touch or self-simulation in that it causes physical harm or damage or it's excessive in some way, or it's, incur it's incur occurring in public uh, despite being told not to do that in public, uh, being preoccupied with nudity. So looking at others when they're naked or frequently showing off their private parts to other people, um, being preoccupied or um, addicted to pornography. Uh, I have certainly had a number of youth who've come to our outpatient program who very self-admitted addicted that they were porn uh, addicted to pornography at ages 14 or 15 years old. And um, it's especially problematic when um, the preoccupation with pornography has uh, displayed children or a lot of aggression or violence. Um, some other concerning behaviors, so sexual touching without permission or consent, uh, sexual interactions with others which are developmentally inappropriate or illegal, uh, sexing related instances since it is uh, creating uh, and potentially disseminating uh, CSEM, <clears throat> and sexual contact with animals, uh, as well as coercive or aggressive sexual contact or penetration. And typically professionals are concerned uh, when a youth sexual behaviors are occurring frequently or more frequently than one would be expected when they're taking place between children of wildly different age, widely different ages, or developmental ages, so a 12-year-old who's with a five-year-old or a 14-year-old with a 10-year-old, um, or they occur between children of different capacity. So that might be intellectual disability, but it could also be a position of authority. So a youth um, who is in a, a supervisory relationship, like a babysitter or a camp counselor, something of that sort, um, when sexual behaviors are associated with strong feelings, so they're engaging in this can be either because they're engaging in the behavior, uh, because they are angry or have anxiety or have fear, and so they act out in a sexual way, or it could also be that the sexual behavior itself causes them to feel angry um, and anxious or fearful or something of the sort. Um, it's a concern when sexual behaviors cause harm or potential harm to any child uh, involving coercion, force, aggression, or threats of any kind. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into the characteristics of who our adolescents are that are engaging in harmful sexual behaviors. So what's important to know about these youth are that about a third of sex crimes are perpetrated by child on child a minor who's offending against another minor. And very importantly, most youth do not reoffend. So recidivism studies show that they vary between three to 15% um, sexual recidivism, depending on the study that it, it is. Um, but one of the most cited is Codwell 2016, which is what I cited here. And results showed a weighted mean base weight rate for sexual recidivism of 4.92%. So we have a very low base rate for recidivism, which is similar to the adult world, although these rates for youth are, are lower. Um, and we know that youth are more likely to have non-sexual reoffense than a sexual reoffense, which is also common with what we've seen um, in recidivism studies with adults. Um, what we know is that um, it's a, a bit of an old uh, stat from 2009, uh, but I still think useful information that 12 to 14 is the peak age for engagement in harmful sexual behavior. And I could just speak anecdotally that this tends to be the age range that we tend to most see um, in, our, in our program, in our outpatient program. Okay, not too surprising, right? But juveniles are not the same as adults. Uh, adolescence is dynamic and it's a fluid stage of development. Uh, and this inability to appreciate the future consequences is linked to structural and functional features in the adolescent brain. And adolescence is really this time that is marked by poor impulse control, emotionality, recklessness, um, lack of responsibility, lack of accountability. And it's not until we're older, until 25 or some research says even, even a little older than that maybe, um, that the brain is fully developed. So what this means is that what works in the adult world 
is going to be different than what should work in the juvenile world. So history had us applying the same principles of assessment and treatment for adults. That's all we had, that's all we knew to our youth. Um, but over the years, certainly um, this has changed uh, and something that we've been progressing forward on and really understanding who our youth are and meeting the, the needs of youth and certainly not applying what we do in the adult world to our kids. All right, so what's so special about these youth? What's so special about youth who um, engage in uh, sexual harm? And how are they different from other delinquent youth? So other youth who engage in delinquent behaviors. Um, so uh, this very, uh, I love the study. I think that it's a, it, it provides us a lot of knowledge. Um, and I, I know that it often gets cited uh, in that way. So um, is sexual harm due to antisociality? Uh, and what they looked at in the study um, from 2010 was whether those who had perpetrated a sexual offense um, were similar or different um, to those who had perpetrated non-sexual offenses in these categories. So what they found was that those who had um, perpetrated sexual harm had less criminal histories, less antisocial peers, less substance use, and greater sexual abuse histories, other maltreatment, exposure to violence, exposure to sexual pornography, social isolation, anxiety, low self-esteem, and atypical sexual interests in comparison to those who had non-sexual offenses. So antisociality, which is often linked to delinquency, is not often associated with youth who engage in sexual harm behaviors. And so these youth are different than those that engage in other types of behaviors, these non-sexual harm behaviors. Okay, so now we're gonna shift a little bit and talk about risk factors and protective factors of our youth who engage in sexual harm behaviors. So risk factors are factors that increase your vulnerability or the possibility that you're gonna engage in a behavior. And it's not all about risk, right? Because there are factors that offer often buffer against risk too, right? Um, and they can protect one from engaging in harmful behavior. So it's important to talk about both. So we're not gonna talk just about risk, we're gonna talk about risk and protective. Um, so we're not focusing all on the negative. And risk and protective factors are often related to each other because what we see is as we increase our protective factors, we're decreasing our risk factors. All right, so some risk factors that are known um, for youth who've um, engaged in harmful sexual behaviors. So our static historical factors, so those that are unchanged, um, or historical, right, um, are prior legally charged offenses, unsuccessful prior interventions, out-of-home placement, and multiple changes in caregivers, and our dynamic factors, so the factors that can be changed and that we often hope to see change in um, with intervention and um, community supports, et cetera, it, our um, dysfunctional parenting, poor educational or vocational skills, antisocial peers or peer rejection, substance use, poor use of free time. And this one, we, I mean, we see, see all of these, of course, but the poor use of free time is something that we, we really often see, again, anecdotally in our program, um, but this especially became more of a problem post-pandemic because even if we had a, a youth who was very positively connected with peers, connected um, in school and engaged in pro-social activities on, on uh, sports teams, for example, the pandemic uh, altered that, right? Out of school for a year and a half, some, some two years, and when they had to go back to school, they no longer had the same interests or motivations that they used to have. Um, social anxiety played a big role. And so they had become so used to playing video games, being on their computer, being isolated and alone, that making that, sh that, that shift uh, was, was really difficult for them. So I know that that's something that, that we often work on with many of the youth that we see. All right, so some more dynamic factors, dysregulated personality or behavior traits. So um, such as aggression, impulsivity, poor frustration, tolerance, defiance, attitude supportive of crime or violence and um, home and environment stability. And what I like to note about that is um, we, it's not necessarily uncommon 
that we might have a youth that we're seeing uh, who is you know, low risk in, in all these other areas. They're really not a, a, a risk factor for them. But when it comes to the stability of their home, we have a, a caregiver who um, is not able to be able to provide the proper support uh, for whatever the reason is. We've had youth who were um, at risk of homelessness and that, that, that home instability or threat of instability was, was really something that we had to consider deeply when thinking about what, what, that, what that did to their risk level. Hi, um, so our protective factors. So uh, the ability for the youth to be able to self-regulate, so to be able to regulate their impul impulses and their emotions, um, their ability to plan and problem solve uh, for adaptive coping skills, um, the youth's ability or the youth's self-esteem, whether they have a positive view of themselves or not, whether they're future-oriented, future and goal-oriented, thinking forward, uh, whether they have pro-social connections, uh, they're, whether they're, they have a close connection with caregiver or caring adult, and spirituality. These have all been shown to be some protective factors against uh, risk for recidivism. Hi. So when we think about um, risk assessment for youth, we think about, well, I would say not just this risk assessment because intervention too. So both risk assessment and intervention, we're looking to the r, &R model, this risk needs responsivity model. Again, this can be a talk on its own. I'm not gonna go into it here. Um, and I know most on this call likely are very familiar with the r, &R model. Um, but really what this is saying is that treatment needs to be guided by risk levels and individualize the youth's needs. So we wanna engage a youth with the, most risk factors and fewest protective ones and provide those youth with higher doses of treatment um, compared to those who have low risk factors and many protective factors, they're gonna need less dosage of treatment. And that's gonna really vary depending on what's available in the community to be able to provide services um, ranging from both from diversion programming through residential programming. Hi, and we wanna target the criminogenic needs by reducing risk factors and enhancing the protective ones and tailor our interventions to be responsive to individual and family learning styles and characteristics. And our base rates are low, right? So we know that sexual recidivism is the rates are quite low and most youth can be served in an outpatient setting with our strong community and family supports in place. So I urge anyone who does this work um, to, or is thought, thought about doing this work, to um, go over to ATSA's website, um, the Association for Treatment of Sexual Abusers, and look at their 2017 practice guidelines for assessment, treatment, and intervention with adolescents who've engaged in sexually abusive behavior. Um, it provides a really nice outline um, for, for what ATSA recommends as their guidelines for providing treatment um, and assessment for this population. Okay, so when we think about risk assessment, we need to consider a few things. And one of those things is the adolescent brain and see assessment through the developmental lens. So we're, we're not gonna necessarily, right? We're not gonna approach a 12 year old the same way we're gonna approach a 17 year old. And we're not gonna think about the way their risk and protective factors play a role in, in the same way. They're gonna be individualized um, as to where they are in terms of their development. Um, and we also want to see risk assessment with youth through this multi-system approach. So there's many systems in place with youth. It's not, it's, right? They're not adults. It's not just the adult, um, although I'd argue a multi-system approach to adults would be beneficial too. Um, but with our, with our kids, they're, they have family. Um, they have guardians that they are supposed to be listening to um, who guide their, uh, their, their daily interactions. Um, we have school. They're in school. Maybe they have a church that they're connected with. So all of these different areas and understanding how they're functioning in all the different spheres of their life to be able to communicate that in the report. Okay, so I wanted to include some of the commonly used assess risk assessment measures. Um, this is not an inclusive list. So I'm just gonna say that they're not all up here. Um, I just use some of the very common ones, um, ones that are more recently being discussed commonly. 
And, and I wanted to put up there the eraser because um, I still still see people using this one. And I know Dr. Jim Worling, who had um, developed the eraser, had come out and said that he recommended no longer to use it. But as of just maybe two months ago, I had seen a report that had it in it. So I know people are out there still using it. Uh, so I just wanted to put it up here that it is recommended to no longer use that scale. We mostly use the JSOAP and the professor currently, and we're using the Youth Needs and Progress Scale, uh, sometimes in our assessments, but mostly as um, in guiding our treatment, which I will talk about in a moment. Hi, so um, risk assessment, uh, meta-analysis that was done had compared, it was in 2012, it had compared the JSOAP, the eraser, the JSTRAT, and the static 99. <clears throat> and it showed that the assessments were better than unstructured clinical judgment alone, but predictive validity rates are moderate. So it's insufficient for risk prediction. Um, so we cannot predict risk. We cannot predict the likelihood that someone's going to sexually recidivate accurately with these assessments. Um, and rather dynamic scales are best for identifying treatment needs and providing this individualized treatment. So scales shouldn't be used as a standalone and they're they're best for identifying treatment needs and providing individualized treatment, which again goes in line with the with the R and R model. Okay, so again, this risk assessment, not prediction. So we're not going to provide, ideally, a low, medium, or high risk uh, descriptor in our reports. Um, we don't have the tools to support that in an evidence based way. So we're going to assess risk, we're going to assess needs, and we're going to identify strengths, and we're going to describe that in the report and how it will change and how that would change depending on how the circumstances of this, this youth's life would change. Um, but we, we can't predict their risk accurately. So we don't have any empirical basis to write someone as low, medium, or high. Now, this, I understand that there's people on here thinking like, I can never get away with that because my attorney is expecting that I write a risk level um, or my court, you know, my court that I work with is expecting this. And all I can suggest or say is that you continue to provide the education around why it's inaccurate to provide the risk level um, and, and why it could potentially do more harm than good um, for that youth. Uh, and I know that we've had those conversations with our court and with our probation, and they're very supportive of this, thankfully. Um, and we've, I've also had these kinds of conversations uh, in private practice as well. Uh, so again, important to assess risk needs and identify strengths. And as may segue into treatment, I want to add, so um, Dr. Sue Righthand had come to our staff and had done a training on the Youth Needs and Progress Scale. Um, and she had said something that I really liked. I'm, I'm, I know that I've heard it other, other places too, but I want to give her credit because she was the one that last said it to me. Um, so assessment's a process. It's not an event. So it's not an exclusive event. It's something that's ongoing. It's over time. And that's why um, we did adapt this Youth Needs and Progress Scale to utilize in, in our treatment program to help guide our treatment. So we we see the kid when they come in and we do it upon assessment. Uh, and then we do it every three months, or um, sometimes it might be depending on when we get to do it. Ideally, it's every three, but sometimes it's every six, depending on the circumstances um, where we're going to update to make sure that our um, our treatment is in the is going in the right direction, and we're still providing services to someone who needs services. Okay, so does treatment work? Um, this is again another talk that could be a talk on its own, um, but I just wanted to be able to, to speak that there is promising results that treatment does work. Uh, and it's more complicated than that, but I'm, I'm for the purposes of today, I'm gonna leave it there. Okay. Um, all right, so our treatment. So treatment is done uh, hopefully through an R&R &R lens, right? That the risk needs and responsi responsivity of that youth is being considered individually. And through that lens, um, we, it's not necessarily a, a manualized program, but the youth's individual needs are being targeted and being met. And so some evidence-based treatment models to be able to approach this behavior, uh, this harmful behavior is through a relapse prevention model or CBT. Um, we've used uh, pathways manuals before, or other CBT type um, uh, 
models or interventions. The Good Lives model, uh, this is something that our program over the past year has, uh, uh, David Prescott has done wonderful training with us uh, in our program. I have to give him, uh, I wanted to give him a shout out and some credit here because it's been wonderful working with him over the past year. Um, this uh, really, this Good Lives model focuses on the strength-based approach and we really find that our youth take to this model, especially our youth who um, feel really misunderstood or denying it or really you know, very shameful about what had happened. And so it's just hard to get them to come in and talk about all the ways in which um, they, they uh, have done wrong and instead trying to focus them more on how we're seeing them as a whole person and someone who caused sexual harm but it was so much more, right? There's so much more to them. Uh, they're not just that behavior. They're a youth who is functioning in all these other ways and, and they're more to them. Um, so getting them to really see themselves as a whole person, not just that behavior, and then working toward building their healthy life. Uh, and then another model is uh, multisystemic therapy for problematic sexual behavior. Um, I would love to be able to, to work within this realm. It was some, it's one of my interests. I, I think that it's fantastic, especially for cases where you have, um, well, many cases, right? To uh, be able to avoid um, potentially a youth having to go to residential, uh, but being able to work with the whole family system in a way that's much shorter term that maybe then an individual or group treatment just for the, the youth might be. Um, and also the, uh, the piece that's important here too is that when there's um, reunification that is part of that process, that's something I didn't even touch on. And again, a talk in itself, um, but when we have a sibling who is offended against another sibling and reunification um, is uh, part of that treatment process, then oftentimes uh, that work is done individually and then the family is brought together to do sessions, whereas MST, PSB really does more of an integrated process. And so working for, with the family unit from the start. Okay. So cultural considerations. Um, so the family really needs to be integrated. This is, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough, but the family really needs to be integrated uh, into treatment for treatment to be effective. The family needs to be able to buy into the process um, because at the end of the day, the youth is going home to their parents, to their siblings, um, to other family members that are in the home. And if they all maintain beliefs um, that are counter to treatment, that it's very hard for the youth to make any progress. So we often see this um, when we have deniers, for example, or partial deniers. Um, we've had youth where they initially are saying, I did, I did not commit that offense. I did not do that. I did not do that sexual harm, harmful behavior. Um, and the parents are very adamant as well. Absolutely not. My kid did not do this. And they, they, they are not willing to budge. Um, and then over time, as we're working with the youth, we could see that they're starting to really come around to being able to talk about what had happened. But when the family stays in that initial stage of, no, my kid didn't do it, um, it's very difficult for the youth to make any substantial, uh, substantial progress. And so we have to spend a lot of time with being able to work with the, the parents right off the bat uh, and making sure that they're engaged, they understand the treatment, that they understand that we address their concerns because what they've been through as a parent to have a child who's... Um, been through the court process for having engaged in an illegal sexual behavior or has perpetrated sexual harm and what that means, uh, being able to give them a space just to be able to talk about what their experience has been uh, is, is really important. Um, so that family buy-in uh, and developing a relationship with the parents is really important. So in doing that, incorporating the family, um, you need to really think about the culture and religion because all of that's really going to play a big role um, not just in the treatment, but just in general about sex, right? So understanding um, like, is sex a taboo topic? Can sex be discussed? What's the view of homosexuality and how can this influence a family or a youth's view if the victim was of same sex? We've had that before too, right? Where 
um, the first thing, the first thing that a, a parent will say is, well, well, my kid's not gay. So this didn't happen. Um, and really being able to, um, have those, those conversations or parents who I, I, I can remember very vividly sitting with a family and saying, the youth has a lot of questions about, um, puberty and what their body's been through. And, uh, a lot of questions about, um, you know, uh, like yeah, about sex and was starting to turn to pornography, but hadn't, hadn't gotten too down, too down yet, uh, the rabbit hole of it. And I remember having that conversation with the parents and the parents were like, oh no, he's way too young. He's way too young to talk about, to talk about that. But he had already been inappropriate, right? In, in, in his sexual behavior. And so re again, being able to have these conversations are really important and, and being able to understand where the family's coming from and the, the family's um, the family's thought process around all of it and, and what's important uh, to, to, their, to their culture, to their religion, and being very sensitive uh, to that and considering their conversations. Um, another thing I want to mention about culture and cultural considerations is the importance of multilingual staff. So not not just um, having English speaking staff. I know it could be challenging, especially depending on where you are, but um, we always try our best to have um, a, a whatever language the youth's parents or family speaks to also have a clinician who speaks the same language. Um, most often in our setting, that um, is Spanish. Uh, and so we try to always make sure that we have Spanish speaking staff for those clients because it's uh, a few things. Um, we're often communicating with the parents. Again, it's important to have them incorporated into treatment. And, um, and so having those conversations through translators consistently, just it's just not as effective. If it's all you have, it's all you have. But if you can prevent it, of course it's best. Um, and not all words or phrases translate in the same way. And so it's important to be able to have that, that contextual knowledge um, in, in having those kinds of conversations. Okay. All right. So that brings me to the end of all my prepared information, but I am very happy to uh, answer any questions that there might be or have coming in. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nikki, for that very thorough overview. Um, you know, happy to happy to see. You know, just starting off the top of you know, just considering how we how we discuss and approach uh, youth that have engaged in some pretty uh, harmful sexual behaviors and different ways that we can uh, we can address these issues going forward. Yeah. Um, I do see we already have some some questions here. I will throw some of them your way. In the meantime, if you have any additional questions for Dr. Colombino, you can enter those for in the Q&A box. Oh, they're, yep, yeah, they're sure coming in uh, right now, but I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and throw, throw a few your way. Um, this first question uh, is more about a, a unique circumstance related to de developmental issues among youth who have engaged in sexual behavior. Um, so this person says, I most often get referrals for youth with developmental disabilities, or autism that are emotionally immature and exploring sex with much younger peers who are at a similar emotional age. Can you discuss how to assess risk factors for this population of youth engaging in sexually harmful behavior? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a that's a really wonderful question. There's some really wonderful trainings out there, again, exclusively on, on this area. So I'd urge if this is like an, an area that um, you see often, uh, definitely um, seek out the ATSA website, but also um, your state chapters ATSA, if, if, if it has one and see if there's any um, upcoming trainings or some past trainings that you're able to download and see in this area, because there's, I've attended a few and, and they were just, they were just wonderful and being able to provide some insights. Um, so uh, intellectually disabled uh, individual um, and those who are on the spectrum. So I will say this, we have had, I have not had, uh, I've, uh, I shouldn't say that. I have a youth, he's, he's not intellectually disabled, but he is certainly cognitively limited. Um, and we see, as so I'm just anecdotally speaking here, um, we have seen the struggle in um, being able, so the impulsivity piece that I was mentioning that is already is a difficulty in adolescence, um, 
ability to appreciate future consequences and be able to plan and incorporate um, all the learned information into their, their daily behaviors, all of that takes much more work. Um, and what I'll also say um, from the, and just slower, breaking it down into smaller pieces, there's, it's certainly able to benefit from treatment, 100%, but it's just meeting them where they're at. Um, and again, being able to take the material that you might traditionally use and break it down in differently um, for, for that individual. Um, we often uh, will have youth who are on the spectrum uh, and when they come through, it's very similar, very similar issue in terms of um, not uh, the, the connection piece, um, not always being able to appreciate. Uh, and, but when we think about treatment, it, they because their um, their learning styles tend to be different as well. Again, it's just meeting them where they're where they're at. Um, and some of that is uh, again, you might like present something uh, not just it, you know written material, but maybe do more videos, maybe more empathy engagement, more so than you might do with um, another individual. Although again, it, it really is gonna, it depends on the case-to-case -case basis. Uh, but overall, I think it's just really meeting them where they're at, what their needs are, any traditional material you use, take it, break it down differently and, um, and, and see what they're responding to and go from there. Sounds like it highlights that responsivity component of the risk need responsivity the element that you discussed earlier. Um, you you just referenced uh, empathy exercises, uh, and somebody did ask, "How do you address building empathy uh, within with youth?" Mm -hmm. That's a great question, um, especially because uh, you tend to be more selfish as it is, right? And they more like about me, 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 um, and they're less likely to see um, somebody else. Uh, not all. I know I'm making generalizations here. That's not everyone, but that it really is something that they learn to be better at over time. Um, and their ability for perspective taking really gets better over time. So there is that developmental piece to it. Um, and I, again, I, we really like to do a lot of uh, uh, different formats. So it's not all just talking, it's not all just um, uh, written materials or exercises, but we like to do videos. We do role plays sometimes with the youth to get them to really see what it would be like to be the other person in the situation. And it, we usually don't always start with what the, the sexual harm was. We start it more general. We start it with, so it's it's less intimidating, it's less threatening. Um, so we don't go right into the victim empathy, for example, um, but, but take it back a piece and really just overall um, empathetic uh, abilities and, and start there. And then eventually go into more of the Im victim impact, victim empathy. That's That's the approach we typically take. Wonderful. Um, we, there's a couple of questions that seem to be asking about the just the front end of therapy here in the first place. Um, one at, one person asks, can you offer your thoughts on how to initially approach the therapeutic process overall with youth in this particular context? I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that that's um, something that when, when we have new clinicians coming on, uh, it's one of the, you know, like, okay, I have all my materials, I have all the training, now what do I do? Like, right, for the first couple of sessions. And I say, you approach it like you approach any other therapeutic relationship. Um, so you wanna get to know, you wanna meet them, you wanna get to know them for them, what are their goals? Um, so obviously we're gonna focus, focus on the sexual harm. Of course, that's why you're here with me. Um, but we want to see you as a whole person and what, what's your whole life look like and what are your, what are your life goals for yourself? Um, and their goals might not match up with what I think their goals should be. And that's okay too. We, you know, we'll, we'll work on that over time. Um, but, but you approach it like you approach any other uh, therapeutic relationship. That alliance is so key, right? We know that the alliance is so important in therapeutic success. The research has shown that time and time again, and it's no different here. Um, they're not gonna wanna talk to you about the most shameful thing that they have ever done causing the sexual harm if they don't trust you, if they don't have a relationship with you. So just start there, build the relationship, get to know them. And then you can start to dive into the, the treatment goals. 
In terms of the formality of doing that or anything else at the beginning of the process, somebody asks, what are your thoughts on group versus individual treatment in this context? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. And I know it really varies on the, the limitations of or the, of where you are, right? Whatever the setting is. So we're an outpatient program where I am. Um, I know the treatment often is done also in more residential type settings. And so it, it's oftentimes, I think there's sometimes a combination of both individual and group. Um, the way that our program structured is we actually do both. So they have an individual therapist that they see um, for the time that they're in our program. And then at some point they'll do group and there, our group runs for um, for 16 weeks, and and they can repeat group if we think that it would be helpful to them. Uh, but oftentimes they're just an individual, so it's just the way our not necessarily it's it's better or worse. We like them to get the group experience because it provides them an opportunity to see that there's other youth who have also been in a similar situation who are facing the same type of obstacles or fears or. Um, and, and being able to, to see the, the other kids are, um, they have the similarities like them in, in that way and be able to bond over those experience, but also really get, have a, an opportunity to everything that they've been learning in individual to also be able to practice uh, in, in a group setting, uh, which, which is nice. And we, we usually mix up um, people who've been in treatment for a while versus people who are newer to treatment uh, so that those who've been in treatment for a while have that ability to really feel confident uh, in, in what they've learned. Um, and we, 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 I think that's a nice, it's a nice process for them to be able to have that. Somebody asked with the caveat of them being unsure of the base rates of youth that have engaged in harmful sexual behavior, um, having experienced their own victimization, um, but asking what are your thoughts on trauma-based therapy, uh, for this population or perhaps in this, that particular context? Yes, a hundred percent. Oh my gosh. Uh, a hundred percent from a trauma informed lens. I think that that's, that goes, um, like I would say without stating, but I should state it, um, that it's important to, to make sure that you're considering the youth's, um, the youth's background. So, uh, as I mentioned before, um, these youth tend to have, uh, more maltreatment, uh, histories, um, more, uh, and higher, higher rates of sexual abuse, histories um, compared to those who are committing non-sexual offenses. And um, so, of course, uh, in, I think it's really important to do a really good uh, assessment in the beginning to have a good understanding, but sometimes they don't, they don't tell us in the beginning. Uh, and it comes out over time uh, about inappropriate behavior. And sometimes it's not even sexual abuse in a tradition, what might be thought of a traditional way, like a contact offense. But sometimes we'll see where youth were exposed to pornography by an adult or an older cousin very early, uh, for example. And they might not have even identified that as something that was sexually inappropriate, but it's in, important for them to, in treatment, be able to start to recognize that and see that over time. And the same thing, similarly, um, those who, uh, they don't consider it, they don't consider it victimization, but they had very young uh, sexual experiences. Um, with someone who was older uh, and they didn't really know what was going on at the time. And again, they didn't, they didn't really see it as abuse and they might not just describe it as abusive in an intake uh, with you or in the beginning of treatment, but over time um, in treatment, they start to see as they're learning about themselves, they'll start to see that uh, it was, it was abuse. Um, yeah. um, perhaps fast forwarding a little later in the therapeutic process, somebody asked, um, can you speak about current approaches to family reunification when the youth who engaged in harmful sexual behavior did so against a, a younger sibling? Sure. Um, so I will try to give my brief version because again, this could be an entire talk, much longer than even an hour. Um, but I'll tell you what a tradition looks like and it might vary really place to place, but I'll tell you um, generally what I believe best practices are and then um, what what we do. So it's always guided by the person who was harmed. So if we're going to use the word victim, then it the victim, um, the one that was victimized, the one that um, the the one who had the sexual harm against them. And hopefully they're engaged in treatment. We will not do reunification unless um, the victim has a therapist um, and that they've already worked through treatment and the therapist will tell us when the victim is ready. And so oftentimes we have great dialogue with in communication 
with our um, with our victims therapists to make to make sure that uh, both both treatment needs are uh, all the treatment needs are being met. Um, and then at some point when the victims sort of completing their treatment and it's time, they'll check in with us and say like, okay, oh, uh, how is how's the youth who's who've who's perpetrated the sexual harm? How is how is he doing? Or I'm saying he because oftentimes I think we've only had be one or two females in our in our program in all my years there. Um, and uh, so how is how is he doing? And we'll we'll give an update on treatment. And it's not necessarily uncommon that he might need a little bit longer. Uh, and what that means is, so when I say, how would you assess that, right? How would you know when when they're ready? And we often say that they're going to be able to. So we call it the clarification process. That they're going to be able to go through clarification, where they're going to be able to accept responsibility. Um, for what had happened, and that they're not going to do more harm than good during that process, uh, that they're not going to be um, placing any blame on the victim, that they're not going to be, um, you know, full of cognitive distortions or disordered thinking that's leading that, again, minimizing the offense in any way, but is really able to um, take ownership and describe also how this would not happen again, because of the work that they've done in treatment. Um, and really be there to hear to whatever the victim needs, right? So sometimes um, there'll be some letter writing back and forth where the victim might um, write out a list of questions. One of the most common questions usually is, why did you do this? To, like, why me? Like, why did you do this to me? And, and then working with um, the youth that you're working with, the one who perpetrated the sexual harm to really be able to go through those questions in advance and write, write some responses. And sometimes they're shared um, the letters could be shared, but oftentimes they're reserved and eventually there'll be an in-person um, meeting where they'll go through that information with, with each other. Well, we, we have passed the hour, but we do have a couple of more minutes for questions. I'll make sure to ask one or two more questions that people have uh, asked about the assessment side of things. Um, so just broadly, you had referenced before the age range you were referring to, um, somebody asked, what recommend, recommendations do you have for assessing risk of young adults whose offending only occurred as a youth? And this person gives the example of a youthful person, who, youthful offender who's turned 18 within an institution or treatment program. Mm -hmm. So I would say I would consult the manual depending on how much older they are but I'd probably use the JSOAP or um, the professor or the youth needs progress scale. So I would, I, I would use, I would consult the manuals just to, cause I don't know how old they're, they're going up to um, when you're, when you're talking, the offenses happen when they were a juvenile, but that's what we do uh, in our program um, because the, because the offense happened when they were a juvenile. There's like, for example, you wouldn't use the static 99 or the SVR 20 because it wasn't normed. Um, on even though the ages are, if they're 20 years old now and they might be in that age range now, they, the norm sample was not for juveniles. Uh, do you approach adolescent assessment of child sexual exploitation material differently than for other inappropriate sexual behavior assessments? Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's, uh, uh, yes, because there, it's a different type of a, uh, um, sexual harm that was caused. Um, we still see it as sexual harm. We certainly describe it in that way. And we, uh, we look to the research to give us the risk and protective factors, which are slightly different, but also similar. Um, and there's, to be honest, there's not a lot known out there. There are very few research studies uh, on youth who uh, engage in CSUM offenses. Um, but we use it what we got and we what we're currently doing is we write uh, descriptives around um, what those risk factors are and which risk factors are present based on what the literature that we have. Um, and then our treatment, our treatment model looks pretty similar um, as in that we identify according to the youth needs progress scale about different areas of intervention that we want to target. And then we, um, we every couple of months we're we're reassessing to make sure um, those have changed, but they're, they are different. I mean, their motivating factors sometimes are different. Uh, they, they have a whole whole other sets of issues sometimes that come up around. Uh, one, one that I'm thinking about in particular is 
the, uh, the minimization of the offense is a lot easier because they're like, well, I didn't touch anyone. I didn't actually, you know, harm someone. And so we have a lot of that, um, that we combat differently, uh, in, in being able to work in treatment and being able to help them to see that, uh, that there was sexual harm that was done. It's a process, but they, they get there. Dr. Colombino, Nikki, um, thank you so much for sharing with us, taking out the time of very busy schedule and the work that you do to, to share um, both in treatment and in assessment and in just overall um, a humanistic uh, perspective on, on the work that you do. It's very much appreciated. Corey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That wraps up this week's Law and Mental Health series. Um, Stay tuned for next week when we have Drs. Danielle Slaykoff and Dr. Stacy Merkin, who will be discussing um, service providers' experiences working in intimate partner violence for trans and immigrant women clients. Um, until then, I hope you have a great rest of the week, and we will see you next week.